Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We are so beyond excited to have award-winning author, poet with us, Pat Mora, and we are going to talk all about her books and the wonderful poetry that she's the years. So, and then we'll also dive into some reading and writing tips for poetry with students. Just as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and the link to view the webinar and the poetry resource guide, which I'll be talking about in a little bit, will be shared within the week. You will be getting an email with all of the resources and things that we're going to be talking about. And you can also always email me if you need a certificate for uh, of completion. So really quickly, because we have a lot to cover in this webinar, uh, Pat and I will introduce ourselves, and then Pat is going to take us through three of her um, poetry titles. So we'll talk about My Magic Wand, Book Joy, Word Joy, and Water Rolls, Water Rises. Then I will provide some details about our poetry resource guide, and then Pat is going to take us through her tips on reading and writing poetry with students, which I'm really excited about because she has so many wonderful strategies to share with us. And then we'll go over some of our poetry collections that we have to offer at Lee and Lowe, and then we'll conclude with a question and answer. So I am Katie. I am the Senior Literacy Manager here at Lee and Lowe Books. You may have seen me from other webinars before. I create the Teacher's Guide and the Teacher's Guides and Educator Resources here at Lee and Lowe. And I also work with nonprofit organizations and professors on how to incorporate diverse literature into uh, your respective programming and, cu and curriculum. I also am a certified uh, literacy instructor and teacher in New York State, and I have my master's in uh, literacy and childhood general education from Bank Street. And now we're on to Pat. You want me to talk? Sure. Pat, oh, well, I am so excited to be with you. <laughs> Let me just say, Katie is going to sleep really, really well tonight <laughs> because she has worked very hard on this with me. And I'm sure it's been a challenge. I'm in Santa Fe uh, and uh, she's in New England, I think. But uh, in brief, uh, I... Um, was born in El Paso. Uh, I had wonderful, wonderful parents. I have four siblings. I'm the oldest and every one of the others would say I was always bossy, bossy, bossy. <laughs> They're wrong, but that's what they'd say. I have three amazing children, a son and two daughters. I have a granddaughter named Bonnie and she will appear and then I have a new grandson who's four months old, Martin, and he will appear in a later book. Mm -hmm. I am really, really happy to be here with you. Oh, and I'm just so sad I can't see you. <laughs> well, Pat, we are just so thrilled to have you join us because really we are just incredibly honored. You are such a prolific author and poet and we are just beyond happy that we get to hear you talk about poetry. Ah, it's a favorite subject and many people will write then say, she's weird. <laughs> I, I may be weird, but I, I've loved poetry since I was probably five or six. But I think it's important to show today that poetry is fun and poetry is exciting and accessible for everyone. Including teachers and librarians. Yeah. Yeah. So we, Pat, like I mentioned before, Pat is going to take us through three of her, uh, three of her poetry um, books with us. And this is My Magic Wand, our newest title from Pat. So My Magic Wand is about my gorgeous granddaughter, Bonnie. And uh, she is in third grade now. And I'm really grateful to the illustrator, Amber Alvarez. Uh, I don't always meet the illustrator. In this case, Amber and her husband did come up. Uh, I was visiting Bonnie and um, 
the, uh, her, the illustrator, Amber, and her husband came to the house and it was COVID, so we all sat outside and it was just wonderful to meet the illustrator. I mean, that's a real thrill for me. I, I write the words, but somebody else helps bring them to life. And, and especially in children's books, you know, the illustrator is mighty, mighty important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, Scott, can you read yeah. a poem for us and, and tell yes. us a, little bit, a story about this poem? So first I'm gonna talk about the illustrations, of course. So I'm sorry you can't see my husband who's up there. Uh, I'm in the red dress. He now has more gray hair, I would say. And I have all gray hair. Uh, and we're da dancing, which he does not like to do, but you know, there are things you do for a book. And then below that is my redhead third child, uh, Bonnie's mother, who is a, a cat veterinarian. How's that? Dr. Wow. Cecilia Burnside and her husband. And here's Bonnie, my darling Bonnie. That doctor, that uh, dog is no longer with us, but here we go. Let's dance. Watch us dance. A little ballet, some jazzy steps, and country swings, then hip hopping and line dancing. Now we'll do them again. A bailar, come join our spin. And I wish we were all in a room where we could join and dance together, but maybe later in the day, with somebody in your family, you can do the dance. Yeah, I think this is such a great one to- You do it with Charlie, my friend. Oh, well, my son, who is now two, this is his absolute favorite book. And, oh, the, book. and the words that he has picked up from, po from your books of poetry, Pat, alone, just demonstrate how powerful a medium it can really be. And in just few words, you can, you know, you can demonstrate the essence of dancing and you can really have fun with this one, especially in your library classroom or whatever setting you're in. Okay, book joy, word joy. Well, again, I want to say something about the illustrator because I do my part, but Raul Colon has illustrated numerous of my books and we probably met only once. Mm. He's extremely handsome. <laughs> And um, uh, we, were, we were at a mic together at a conference. And um, he's a quiet person, um, but I have always felt that when they tell me Raul Colon is, or, uh, what do I think about Raul Colon to illustrate a book? I'm always thrilled because he's, he's gifted. And you see that in this book. Uh, you can see it on this cover, Book Joy, Word Joy. So collecting words. All day I collect words, words that move like wiggle, glowing words, candle, drifting words, butterfly, singing words, ding dong. I collect words that make me smile like tiny, that fill my mouth bubblegum and bumblebee that float along river that have a brown scent, cinnamon that sweetly stretch, caramel. I collect short, hard words like brick, soft words, lullaby, cozy words, snug, funny words, rambunctious, scary words, snake, jumpy words, hiccup, big words, onomatopoeia, oink, oink. I whisper, say, shout, write, and sing my words. What words will you collect today? Wow, Pat, that was amazing. Look Before at that we, art though. Really, can we, because this is just such chock full of good content for the educators and librarians on right now. Can you tell us a little bit about what 
the words book joy and word joy mean and why you created this? That's why I love her. Um, you know, I have been a reader, as I said, since I was a little girl. My mother was a reader. Uh, we always had books in the home. Um, and so books are just an incredible part of my life. And so I came up with this word book joy. Now it's probably been almost 20, 20 years and decided to uh, about 23 years ago, my wonderful web manager, Bobby Combs out there would correct me if I said it wrong, um, to do uh, have a site on book joy, word joy. Because I feel like our young people are bombarded by television. And, you know, it's all supposed to be fun and funny and action. And uh, human beings are more than that. So it's not that I am opposed to television. It's not that I'm opposed to fun. But I do think people need, people of all ages, including our children, you know, quiet and the opportunity to savor text. Mm -hmm. And I think the children that don't get that will have a harder time in school. And ultimately, I think in many jobs, you know, we need quiet to be able to think and to be our most creative selves. Mm. Right, exactly. And lastly, water rolls, water rises um, is, we, I love this book and I share it with a lot of curriculum developers and educators for STEM. If, if, you know, if people are looking for books on water, this is a wonderful way to fuse STEM and poetry together. So I haven't had the pleasure of meeting by Milo So, but she is again, an incredibly gifted, I would say sort of a gentle illustrator. And this is a beautiful book. It's a bilingual book, which was good for me. I'm bilingual, but I'm certainly English dominant. Uh, I have no memory of not speaking both English and Spanish. Mm -hmm. And it's been extremely both useful to me, but I would say joyful to me. Porque me encanta hablar en español. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, shall I read this poem? Yes, this please. is one of the images in Water Rolls, Water Rises, El Agua Reda, El Agua Suba. In the murmur of marsh winds, water slumbers on moss, whispers soft songs far under frog feet. En el viento susurrante de los patanos, El agua duerme sobre musgo, murmura suaves canciones bajo patitas de ranas. It's beautiful. And Pat, why did you, what compelled you to write about water? <laughs> well, it's awesome interesting. Question. You know, I'm a <laughs> desert creature. I was born in El Paso um, and it's pretty dry there. Uh, Santa Fe is also dry, but not as dry. My husband is a water scholar. He is uh, a retired professor of anthropology. He was a professor at the University of Cincinnati mm -hmm. and uh, had the privilege of working all over the world, worked in Pakistan, uh, in the Maya area, in Bali, in Greece. And I got to go along on many of the trips. Wow. So I was... Um, I think I've always been a little fast. We're fascinated sometimes by what we don't have. So people can be fascinated about the desert. Uh, well, I'm fascinated by water. Yeah. And so this, the book was a good opportunity to sort of explore that. Mm. And we can share that, you know, that's a great way to share with, with kids too. What are you thinking, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Right about maybe start out with write about what they know and like and love. All teachers and librarians do that. But also maybe what, they, what they'd like to experience. Yeah, sure. 
Um, thank you so much, Pat, for, for taking the time to read some of your incredible poems with us. That was just such a joy to listen to you. Um, so our poetry resource guide, it contains a lot of the information that Pat is going to talk about, but it's a really great resource to take back with you into whatever educational setting you're in on ways that you can make poetry fun and engaging. And there are lots of different strategies on how to incorporate poetry into your everyday teaching. And there are a lot of resources at the end, different websites and organizations that have curated lists of resources on poetry and books about poetry, which from Lee and Lowe, which you'll see here. And then as you can see on the other, you know, this is not the whole guide. Um, I just took snapshots of it, but uh, you'll see on additional resources for teaching poetry, Children's Day Book Day is the first resource listed. And Pat is going to go all into Children's Day Book Day at the end because it's, well, every day is Children's Day Book Day, which Pat taught me about, but it's the actual day is coming up. So she'll talk all about that, which I'm really excited to hear from her. But now we are going to hear from Pat. Pat is going to share all about her tips on reading poetry in the classroom. So Pat, we'd love to hear from you. You know, where do we start? I'm a new, you know, for example, I'm a new teacher or a librarian, and I'm really intimidated by poetry. How can I get myself reading poetry? How can I encourage my students to read poetry? How do I make it a part of my classroom routine, everyday pedagogy. So I know that those are very, you know, we could spend days talking about that. Um, but if you want to share a little bit with us now, we would greatly appreciate it. Well, one of the things I miss, and I said this to Katie earlier, is that I love audiences. I've always loved audiences. And so I'm sorry, I'm not seeing you. But um, because the first question I would ask you is to be really candid and think, well, how do you feel about the word poetry? Mm -hmm. Because I think where for me, I sort of swoon at the word, which tells you probably how <laughs> weird I am. But you know, as I said to you earlier, I've loved poetry since I was a little girl. I. Um, I have this book. Can they see this book? Yes. Yeah. The Childcraft book. And the first, my parents bought the Childcraft books for all of us. And it's a wonderful set, no longer printed, of course. And it had fabulous poems, such as The Cow by Robert Louis Stevenson. The friendly cow all red and white, I love with all my heart. She gives me cream with all her might to eat with apple tart. Now today, we probably wouldn't say with all her might because then students would say, well, what do you mean with all her might? And we'd get, you know, it's a different time in education. But I love the music of the poem. And what sometimes surprises me is that as a society, you know, there's so much music, there's music in people's cars, there's music on the bus, there's music, where, you know, on a shopping center. And poetry is a kind of music. And so why is it that one kind of music is so popular? Mm -hmm. And I think one reason is that poetry, one, it feels like a heavy word. It feels like I may have to think. But also I think Poetry re requires that we be willing to be still. I mean, other than twinkle, twinkle, little star or something like that. Poetry really, really invites you to be still. Well, all reading invites us to be still, but maybe poetry invites us to be a little more still. And I think we live in a society that's a little antsy about that. So I do think that if teachers and librarians themselves can enjoy poetry, something you enjoy, then it's gonna be more likely that students will pick that up mm -hmm. and more likely 
that you may have creative ways to doing it. Maybe break them up into small groups. And I mean, you all know this better than I do, but I do think that uh, the word poetry um, is, has its own weight, weight for good, wait for good, but also it can be off-putting. Mm -hmm. And we need to know that our, stu our students may feel that. And so how do we kind of lighten it up so they can relax? Mm -hmm. We have to relax so they can relax. So Pat, if I, you know, if I am intimidated or I feel, um, you know, if I think poetry is a heavy word and I'm a teacher, what do you recommend? You know, where do I start? How do I get comfortable with it? And how do I, how do I do a poetry unit with my students at the same time? Well, I would think I definitely, well, I'm a big, you know, go to the library person, but you can go to the school library. I'd ask the librarian at school, what's mm -hmm. a poetry book for children that I can just relax and enjoy. I think that, I mean, of course, Lee and Lowen and I would like you to think that My Magic Wand is one of those books, but it's certainly not the only book. But I think you do, I think relaxing really helps with both reading poetry, but I'm also going to say later on, I think you need to be, able to relax to write poetry. Mm. Just relax. I also wanted to mention, I mentioned earlier that I have a two-year-old son who my magic wand is his favorite book. And you would not, you would not think, you don't equate poetry with early childhood or with preschool education, but poems are, are condensed text. And it was so, it was so enjoyable for us to read them together because we could read a poem and, and come back to another one later. Um, you can also do that in your classroom. You know, you don't have to go through a poetry anthology in one sitting. That's also the joy of poetry is that if you're getting used to it, if you're getting comfortable with the, with the medium of poetry, it doesn't have to be so taxing and doing it all at once. I like that. And I, again, I miss audiences because this is when we could say, well, for those of you who aren't fans or who feel intimidated, it always helps me to hear how you feel. Yeah, and I mean, very interesting share in the, we, can, we, can, we can share in the chat, um, you know, what if, if teachers and, and librarians have done poetry units before, how did they feel? What um, you know, what did they do? Well, I just uh, saw a text from Sandy. So thank you, Sandy, wherever you may be, that uh, children love to play with language. And I would agree. The only thing I would say is not all children. And I guess I am always fascinated by people who are not like me. So yes, I love to, to play with language. And I think a lot of children do love to play with language. But you know, from visiting schools through the years, there are many children who are intimidated by text. It could be because they speak another language uh, as a first language, but that's not always the only reason. So one of the challenges of wonderful teachers and wonderful librarians is realizing the complexity of the class. First, your own feelings that have to be honored, but the complexity of the class. I think I'm losing my scarf through this whole thing. And eventually I probably won't have any clothes on. So I'm gonna put that on. <laughs> so Pat, um, before we go transition to writing, you know, what do you do with a student who doesn't love to play with language or maybe struggling with poetry more than others? What do you do? Yeah, and I think a lot about those students and, um, and certainly, and I'm not gonna be able to pull it up right now, but one of the, one of the poems in, in this, I have written a lot about it because that isn't what I was like. So we're kind of always fascinated by the other. And I think 
And I think this is true for students, but also for adults. I don't know why I'm on this kick today, but the importance of relaxation. I want students to relax, not to be so worried about the grade, but maybe if they could write a sentence that they just enjoy writing and they won't be graded on it. And good teachers and good librarians do this automatically. Yeah. But I think that one of the challenges of teaching, and I taught briefly kind of all levels, is both to give the really talented, good student challenges, but they're also students who are, have a lot of talent, but they lack self-confidence. Mm. They have a lot to say and they have a lot to draw. And it's, it's the challenge to a good teacher, a good librarian, to lure them in. And to do that, you kind of have to get to know them a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, Pat, if you want, I think I'm going to move on to tips about writing. Um, and uh, I wanted to share that for some people who are doing poetry units in their classroom right now, there is a great resource on Read, Write, Think, which is um, through NCTE on different types of poems and, and, and other resources that you can incorporate in your poetry unit. And this is another poem from My Magic Wand. And I mean, on the East Coast right now, we're, we're enjoying this beautiful spring weather. So I wanted to share this poem because it's just so beautiful, the bright illustrations. And it's really such a great time to get kids outside. And like you said, Pat, relaxing, you know, if students are able to relax outside and, you know, the creative juices can start flowing. We're have one, having one of those days here and I can't wait. As soon as we're finished, my husband and I are going to go walk our paths out back because we have had a, for us, cold weather of late. Yeah. And so it's, it's wonderful to think of being able to go outside. So tips on writing poetry. Okay, this is, there's a lot to cover here. Yeah, all right. Well, my first tip, of course, is I want teachers and librarians to write it. Uh, and I think uh, experiencing the process, you know, it's just like driving a car. You were able to teach your child to write a to drive a car because you drove a car. You probably didn't teach your child to drive a car if you didn't drive a car. Right. So I think, I think um, we are more likely to meet our students at their, whether they're college students or you know, elementary school students at their place of self-doubt if we experience it first. So then we can apply, then we can use these tips to brainstorm ideas. I think that can be a, a really helpful thing. You know, a class teacher says or librarian, well, it's a beautiful spring day. So let's each put, put down five words that we think would be fun to put in a poem. We may use them, we may not. Then have a little sharing. Maybe ask them to draw it just for themselves. Again, I think the process of writing to a great extent is a process of loosening up. And then I think your more creative self, and I'm saying this as much to my friend, Bobby, who's out there, as a, and she's laughing, as um, she's my web manager, as, uh, as I would be saying it to an eighth grader, you know, that we need to be able to relax. I love the point, uh, point that poems do not need to rhyme. But I would say, you know, and I don't know, I'm not looking at it right now, but poetry to me is about music. And it's about creating music through words. And I think that can be a way, again, for students particularly students junior high and above, who hear a lot of music, to think about it. I think with the little ones, 
It's more about play. Can you play with words? Can we play with words together? The, the idea of poetry, I think it's an intimidating word, as is the word writing. So you put those two together, and that's kind of double intimidation, right? Writing poetry. So I think we have to figure out a way to make it relaxing and as experimental as starting a little garden, you know? that you're just trying to create something. It may work, it may not. It's too bad it, that everything gets graded, but I was a teacher and people would say I was a very hard teacher. But um, I think, you know, not everything needs to be graded. And students need to, and you know this better than I do, students need to experience success, just like we do in the kitchen or any place else, you know. We yeah. need to experience success. I love be brave. And Pat, I love the, in the writing secrets poem, that's from book joy, word joy. I love in the last, you know, stanza. And we usually know more than when we begin. I believe that. And I believe that's for any of us, even, you know, famous and accomplished poets, you know, that we might see in the Poetry Society or Academy of American Poets or whatever. It is a journey. That's one of the things I love about it. You are discovery. And in that sense, it's a little bit like gardening. You're always discovering if you're careful. Mm. Wow. Those are so many great tips. And again, this is another poem from Water Rolls, Water Rises that I And took. talk about illustrations. I mean, this is, these are beautiful illustrations. And each one sort of has its own mood. I'm sorry, I've never gotten to meet her, Milo, so. The, the perspective on this is yeah, just, yeah. it's fascinating. Okay. I know this girl. I know this girl. That's do my Bonnie. She's in the third grade now. Do you want to read the poem, Pat? Sure. Delicious. And she calls me Sita, uh, which is short for Mama Sita. And she calls Vern Sito. The funny thing is, I got the name from a friend who did not speak a word of Spanish. So it was a, word, a friend in El Paso who called her grandmother Sita. And when I was expecting my first child, I said, why do you call your grandmother Sita? And she said, oh, well, we call her that for Mama Sita. And I thought, man, if I ever have a child, I'm gonna have her call me Sita, and I did. <laughs> so delicious. Sita and I read the recipe we measure and stir to make sweet dough. With cookie cutters, I shape flowers, moons, stars. Slowly they bake. And our house smells like a giant cookie. Yum. Delicious. I don't get to see Bonnie as often as I'd like, but we did have a good time making those cookies. Oh, it's just so sweet. Um, and another example of what kids can write about, you know, just everyday experiences, like, right. That, that's just, but it's so special. I think again, it's just the word poetry that, um, feels heavy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know what we do to ease that, but that's, I mean, I love the word poetry, but I, I think it can be intimidating. Sure. Yeah. And so Pat, you know, to conclude on some of your tips, now the editing process, another editing, revising some more daunting words for uh -huh. educators and librarians. Um, so, you know, before we move on, anything you want to share about what editing looks like with kids and poetry? Well, I, I would say, you know, Again, I was a hard grader, so it's funny that I'm <laughs> the one saying shocking. this. Huh? <laughs> it's surprising to me. Oh, I was. You could ask my students. Um, <laughs> but um, I, uh, I think our students pick up a lot more than we want to think from us. So if they sense your excitement or your delight or 
then I think they can come along on the journey. And I used to visit a lot of classrooms, you know, and there are some educators who like tight control. And I understand that. But I do think if we want our students to be creative, we have to get them to relax enough that they can really show us who they are. They know how to hide who they are. Mm. Not from their friends, but certainly from their teachers and librarians. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, when it comes to students, you know, looking at their work and feeling so like what you said, hiding themselves, feeling self-conscious, you know, how do we encourage, you know, do you just move on from the editing process? What does that, you know, do you even, for students who are intimidated by poetry, do you encourage editing? Do you skip it? You know, what do you suggest? Well, I really have great confidence in good teachers and good librarians and that they, they know their students. They need to know their students. And so with some of them, it may be taking somebody aside and saying, you know, I, uh, I don't think you're having a good time with this. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Mm. And I think if students, I'm not saying this is always true, but often if a student thinks we really care, they can reveal a little of themselves. Let's face it, even with our fellow adults in the teacher's lounge, there are people who do not reveal very much of themselves. So sure. that's just life. Yeah. Mm. So really getting to know your students is critical to any of these steps, right. reading, and, writing, and revising. And it's not empty praise. It's really finding something that you think when you see that word, you know, you see that word sweet dough. Ooh, I like the way you did that. It takes time. Yeah. Um, Rachel in the chat said about your question, Pat, you know, I see you're having a hard time with this. What makes you say, you know, what makes you feel that way? And she said, what a good question to ask a non-poetry lover. And really getting to, you know, how getting to understand their hesitations and also trying to transform them. And I would also say our hesitations. Yeah. I remember visiting a college, I think it was in the Midwest, because I used to do a lot of travel. And um, students were going to go into a class, and we were going to talk about poetry. And But we weren't going to talk about teaching poetry. We we're going to, it was an English class. We were going to talk about their poetry. And it was very, very clear to me that they did not like it. They did not like writing it. They didn't like being graded on it. So I do think the word poetry is, it's an unnecessary hurdle and we can be part of, you know, making it seem more like song. Sure. Um, so before we get to Pat, um, to Pat's Children's Day book day, and I also want to leave like 10 minutes at the end because we have some great questions for you, Pat. We, Lee and Lowe has a poetry collection. We have many poetry titles that we pride ourselves on. We're really proud of our po poetry collection, um, both backlist and frontlist that we have to offer at Lee and Lowe. Biography, Spanish, um, STEM, like I mentioned with Water Rolls, Water Rises, ev everything you could think of. Um, so please, I encourage you to check out our poetry collection. And Pat also has her her own poetry collection on our website. Um, actually, you have one picture book with us, Pat, um, a library for Juana. Um, that's not poetry, but everything else is poetry. So Pat, this is Pat's beautiful website. And I also- Did you hear that, Bobby? Yes, Bobby. It's a, beautiful, it. <laughs> it's a beautiful website. And it's really impressive because there are tons of educator resources, but we want to correct that. 25th is 26th. This is the 26th oh, yes. anniversary of right children's. Here. Oh, there it is. There we yeah. go. Good for you. 
So Pat, yeah, why don't you um, why don't you tell us a little bit about Children's Day Book Day? It's been a long journey, and there's a lot about it on my website about being interviewed at the University of Arizona many years ago, probably 26 years ago. And the person who was doing the interview, uh, she was, we we're talking about poetry. Um, and uh, she said, well, when the program's over, would you tape a few uh, of your children's books in Spanish that you've written? And I said, yes. And she, I said, what are you going to use it for? And she said, Dia del Niño, Day of the Child. I'd never heard of it. So I walked out of the radio station. I went up to the cafeteria at the university and I was to have lunch with a group of uh, faculty members. And I said, what is Dia del Niño? And they said, oh, well, in Mexico, it's Day of the Child. And I said, and what happens? Well, kids get treats. Maybe there's a picnic. And boy, I walked out of there and I thought, we need to do this. We need to do this and we need to do it in English and Spanish and any other languages that people would like to use. I'm all for it. But certainly English is the official language in the United States. But it's the whole idea that every day of the year is Children's Day Book Day. So with Mother's Day and Father's Day, you know, one in May, one in June, Although we say, oh, it's every day of the year, we know that's not true. But for Children's Day Book Day, I really want it to be true. You know, that for teachers and librarians, there is this sort of undercurrent of we love books, we want you to love books. And when you come into this classroom or into this library, this is a place where we all share a love of books, a love of reading, maybe acting them out. I mean, there are all kinds of ways to open up books for different kinds of students. But um, particularly now with my granddaughter, and I now have a new grandson, but it'll be a while before he can even hold a book. Um, but uh, it is just so important to me that children regardless of the economic status of their families, experience at an early age, the pleasure of holding a book, reading a book, that there are all kinds of books. Your mother might like one kind of book, you don't like that, you know, but we need to nurture a love of reading. Billions are being spent getting kids to do stuff on the web. And it's not usually about reading. So I'm really relying on teachers and librarians and family members who know the power of text. I'm muted. Um, thank you so much, Pat. That's a beautiful description. And you know what? What celebrations of Dia Children's Day Book Day have you seen throughout your career? You know, what does that look like? for someone who wants to start, say, this year? I've seen everything from small ones, you know, an individual classroom or a school. I've seen both of those. And maybe there's, you know, a treat. Let's face it, <laughs> treats help. So maybe somebody reads a book. Maybe I was at one where in every one of the classrooms, a different parent came in and some read in different languages. So we heard a book together and then we all had a treat. So it needs to be a happy occasion. This is not a lecture. This is the delight of reading, you know, and April, uh, it's April 30th, but you know, calendars are calendars. So it may be April 30th, one year is on a Friday, but on another year, it's on a Wednesday. You do it any way you want to do it. I have seen great celebrations at public parks. I mean, with complete with music and, you know, they were having a good time, but part of it was also books were there, librarians and teachers were there. So how do we connect our love of reading with what we know about children and families? I mean, I really think this is a big part of our job 
uh, in terms of being good citizens of this country. Yes. So Pat, actually um, in the chat, we, and this was another question. Um, you know, we can get to questions in a second. In the past, you have written a letter to introduce DIA. Do, is that updated or where can we find that? Well, actually, uh, this afternoon, I'm going to go to the DIA section of my site <laughs> and kind of look over everything okay. and see what are some things that we need to update and what are some things that are fine. Bobby is fainting when she hears me saying this because then she knows she's going to get an email tomorrow and she says, I don't want to do this. But anyway, she's a great sport and we wouldn't have been able to do Children's Day Book Day without her. I'll tell no, you that. Thank, thank you, Bobby. <laughs> thank you, Bobby. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, I think that would be helpful because like we said, we had we had another person ask about, you know, like a fact sheet that they can share with their administrators. Like, for example, this is what I want to do on April 30th and encourage other people to share about it. So, so those that's- are Am I gonna get those suggestions? Um, am I gonna get that or should I write it down right now? Are you, do you have some, you know, I think someone was asking, do you have something like that that they can present to their administration or to their fellow colleagues? Well, if we don't, we'll have it very soon. Oh, Bobby just shared in the chat. Here's our resource book for Children's Day book day. That Bobby. <laughs> Bobby's we're working already with that. So don't do Good for her. She's been with me a long time, a long time. Um, she said it needs updating, but a good place to start. Bobby, send it to me and I'll start updating it. <laughs> um, okay, so th that's great to hear about Dia. I hope everyone who's joining gets to do something, even if it's not on April 30th, just, uh oh, Pat is a hard, still a hard grader, Bobby said. Pat is still a hard grader. Um, uh, Laureen, Moore, how can you say that? <laughs> Bobby, Bobby said that. Oh, Bobby said I'm still a hard grader. Well, I probably would be, but <laughs> I don't um, okay. grade anymore. So just to conclude, our poetry resource guide can be found on our website. And that will also be included in the email at the end, you know, that you received when you registered. Um, teacher's guides are available for almost all of our books and all of Pat's books on our website. Um, and then on our blog, which is blog.leanlow.com, if you type in poetry, there are so many articles and resources that come up, like interviews with Pat. I think, Pat, a few years ago, we did an interview with you and Raul on Book Joy, Word Joy. So there's just plenty of stuff on our blog. Um, well, I should, I should take a second and say, I cannot say enough about Katie and Leon Lowe. Oh, they have, thank been, you. they have been wonderful stalwart partners through um, through the books and also through Children's Day Book Day. And an old friend just wrote and said, it's OK to be a hard grader, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Laureen. Oh, Jennifer <laughs> says it's called having high expectations. Yes, that is exactly. We have high expectations for our kids. We want the best for our kids. And yeah, I am a product of very hard graders. <laughs> okay, so we have a really juicy Q&A and I'm really excited for some of these questions, Pat, because I think you're going to be able to provide some really helpful Are advice. you so excited that you want to do the answers? No, <laughs> you're the expert. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. How can you infuse, and I think this will apply to a lot of people listening, and I personally would have benefited from it when I was a teacher. How can you, you infuse poetry in your required lesson plans? Well, for example, I can remember being in a college class. It was an English class probably, but at least once a week, the professor began the class by reading a poem. 
So I think when we talk about infusing poetry, yes, I am a believer in creating occasions where we all write together. I think it's very important that teachers be part of the writing. Mm. It's not enough to walk around the room. And I think those days are kind of all, all over, right? We're all writers together. But I also think it's important for students have, to have the opportunity to hear and experience poetry. And that could be that the teacher could read it. The principal might come in one time and read it. Uh, one of the students could read it. Just the, the auditory experience of poetry, I think is a way that students might relax in it. I just feel like many students, and I'm talking about graduate students too, there's a tension if somebody asks you to write a poem. Mm. If I asked you to write one right now, Katie, well, how would you feel? I would, it, I would, it would be challenging because I'm just, first of all, I'm not in the practice of doing it. And it's also, you know, where do I begin? It's uh -huh. you're, you have these boundaries and roadblocks in your mind for what reason, you know, I should, but that's a beautiful way to put it though. Those boundaries are in your mind. When I sit down to write, like I wrote a fun one that Bobby's going to post about St. Patty's Day tomorrow. After all, I'm Patricia, so I'm, I'm big on St. Patty's Day. Um, I just sit, at this point in my life, I just sit and have a good time. Now, if I'm writing a poem that's going to be part of a book for adults, of course, it's, it's a different kind of challenge. But I think it's important that people experience relaxing in poetry. I think that's why that word is so negative. You know, it just feels heavy. Um, and I think if we can just relax and say, well, other people can write a poem. I can write a poem. I could write a poem to my son or to my daughter or to my grandmother. Just have a good time. Yeah. Right. It's all about, I think the, I think the core essence of this webinar, Pat, like you said, is relaxation in reading and writing. And that's where you have to begin. You begin. can't fall asleep, though. <laughs> <laughs> I want you that relaxed, right? So you are relaxing with words, whether yeah. reading them or writing them. But you're awake. You're awake. You want this really alert. So another question that I loved, um, you know, especially with such, like you said, Pat, you know, like the grades and, and high stakes pressure and now with learning loss that's related to the pandemic, how can you use poetry to increase oral reading fluency? Oral reading fluency. Reading, yeah, reading out yeah. loud. So, and, so I think that um, first we have to figure out where is the hesitation or the doubt? You know, it's like, you know, I, I like to cook and I like to garden. So if something isn't working, if we're having trouble getting students to stand up and read poetry, I think we have to, as a group of teachers, maybe, you know, all the second grade teachers think, well, why are we having that problem? Well, they're embarrassed to read in the front in front of the class. Well, how do we deal with that? Should we have them start out in small groups? I'm not gonna say anything you all don't know, but I do think that this is so important. Again, given the billions that are spent getting our kids to sit in front of a set and watch. Well, we're not asking them to watch. We're asking them to do. And actually, that's what life is going to ask them to do, right? Because whether we're dealing with elementary school students, high school students, junior high, college, we are asking them to do, to be able to do, to be able to pr produce text, to be able to perform in front of the classroom. But they are taught day after day to be observers. 
Mm. Yeah. It's a different mode we're asking. Mm. Yeah. Right. It's like the, like what I said, the, the roadblocks and the obstacles it's right. And they uh, have a lot of self-doubt. We did. Um, Pat, really, uh, last question. Um, you know, everyone in the chat and the Q and A has, have just expressed how much they have loved listening to you speak, Pat. And so we're, we are so grateful for this. I'm aspect. missing all of you. I just wish uh, I were with you. You know, I love audiences. Last question. How, and I, I also, I really loved all of the, all of the questions that you asked were just so thought provoking. Um, how can you create quality poetry programming? So, we you know, whatever you're doing at your local library that bridges age differences. So for example, if you have five, and this actually probably pertains to Dia as well. Five, you know, for example, five-year-olds and preteens, like five-year-olds and 12-year-olds. What have you done in the past to kind of, you know, what poetry do you recommend to, you know, to bridge that gap? And I'm gonna talk about the, that for a second, but I wanna be sure, Katie, that though you've used Dia, that oh, sorry, word, Children's Day book day, sorry. Right, well, because we can use both. It's just very important. It's very easy for people to think, oh, Dia, that's for Latinos, we don't have to do that. Yeah. No, I want them to see both and other languages too, very much so. So back to your question. Will you repeat it? Yes. <laughs> you can just, um, just compress it. Bridging the gap between, if you have really young readers and uh -huh. older readers, how do you bridge the gap with poetry? Are you thinking like in a library situation? Yeah. yeah. So my thought would be to occasionally, and I love librarians. So in fact, I'm taking my favorite librarian, Santa Fe librarian to lunch tomorrow. So I'm gonna ask her this question, but I think occasionally it helps to have a small group where you have some of the older students, some of the younger students and pose the question. I think many times we try to come up with answers when there are people who probably have better ideas than we do because they're living it. Mm -hmm. So I think to ask a group, two or three third graders and two or three sophomores and say, well, you know, I know that you all like poetry. I mean, I'd handpick them, right? Um, what could we do that would be fun together? And I think you'd be amazed at the good ideas they've had. Sure. I love that. Yeah, put it on them. Right. That's good. Love it. Okay, Pat, we are out of time. I mean, we could just talk forever and ever, and it was just so much fun. Like I said, everyone in the chat has just been sharing. So, so incredible, you know, so incredible to hear from you, Pat. They're going to I've had the best time of all. Good. I hope you, you know, I hope you didn't get sick of me in the months of planning this. She webinar. did plan. I want you all to know that she worked hard for this, <laughs> for this delightful time that we're having. As I said, Katie will sleep really well tonight or not sleep. I mean, I don't know which it's going to be. Um, thank you, Pat. Well, it was so such a pleasure working with you and you can all reach out to me, kpotter at leanlow.com for a certificate and follow us as usual on social media. And Pat, it was just so wonderful to be with you. And, you know, I, I hope we can do this again. And I just, it's so great to hear from everyone how the information has been so useful to them. So Katie, it's been a, just an honor and a pleasure and I will write your bosses and tell them. <laughs> like, thank Absolutely. You, I will do it. Likewise, Pat. Okay. I'm going to write Bonnie, your digital boss. <laughs> <laughs> she is my digital boss. Uh, well, be well, my friends, and read poetry.
Thanks, Pat. Bye. <laughs>